It's a huge question, of course, for all researchers. Uh, if we've got data that's not super ethically collected, should we use it? Is it is it valid? Is it real? But what if that data makes a huge change to society? What if in that project we find out things that actually make a huge difference to millions of people's lives? doesn't make it ethical, but maybe there were questions worth asking. Enjoy. From the New York Times. Excellent. Good, good, good. June the 10th, 1968. Uh, moon's coming close. Yep. The moon's going to hit us. Uh, we've got hippies. Yep. Uh, Richard Nixon. That is all, that's all three headlines from the front page. It's <laughs> freaky. The, Richard Nixon and some hippies are going to the moon. No, no the moon's coming closer to us. Uh, nice. It, it does. Washington University, uh, the, the faculty committee of the Washington University began an inquiry okay. into the alleged assault of a grad student. Oh, no. By Professor Alvin Guldner. Oh, no. I mean, we see it all the time now, but it was less common back then. <laughs> we don't see it all the time. Can you imagine you're walking around, this professor's beating the shit out of and grad here's students. here's your high distinction. Um, the professor at the time was the Max Weber, not Weber, research professor of social theory. Yeah, okay. Um, he was also the former chairster of the sociology department. It's going to catch on. Uh, he was extremely well published, very, you know, renowned. Yeah, he's, all that he's, shit. he's an achiever and he professor. He's an achiever, yeah, cool. yeah. And apparently very frank in his views and criticisms of others. He, he didn't pull yeah. his punches, it would he appear. He told people what was going down yeah. according to, as Max Weber chair, this yeah. is what I know. Okay. Yeah. The view of Alvin is that's bad, that's good. So anyway, the student he allegedly bashed was called uh, Robert Allen Humphreys. Humphreys was a former Episcopalian clergyman who was completing doctoral work in sociology. Right. I mean, it's a scenario here all the time. You know, the former Episcopalian clergy who does a doctoral work in sociology gets bashed by professor. I mean, if I had a dollar. Happens a lot, really? It does not happen a lot. It does not happen a lot. No, probably never. So Humphreys claimed, the student, that Gordner attacked him the month before, striking him repeatedly and even threatened to kill him. Hey, that's no good. No. Gordner's attorney, because, of course, the professor doesn't speak for himself, he said, look, Yeah, Gouldner and Humphreys exchanged harsh words. Okay. There was harsh language. Yeah. Fruity talk, maybe. Humphreys then tried to push the professor out of his office, according to the attorney. Hang on. Humphreys Humphreys is the student. The student, yeah. Tried to push the professor out of his office. Yeah, out of the the professor's office. So you get out of your office? How dare you, sir? Be in your office? The details weren't- um, It's not the usual way that a fight goes. No. I mean, unless you're like, let's take it outside- and I'm going to push you outside to get yeah, outside, yeah. and then we can fisticuffs. Because in here it's a push and fight, out there it's a fight and fight. How do how do sociologists fight? I'm not really sure. I, I, I just thought usually, usually if there's some sort of confrontation, the professor is trying to get the other person out of their office. You'd think so, professor or not. If someone's fighting you in your office, you'd get them out. Exactly. Not get outed. So he tried to push him out of the office. He claimed that he'd acted in self-defense because, and Humphreys actually hit him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So as you'd expect, you know, he hit me, you hit him, blah, yeah, yeah. blah, you know, bullshit, bullshit. He said, bullshit. he said. Yep. Student said, professor said. Exactly. I, 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 that's not a- that's The age old the, Yeah, that's conflict. not a thing that we want to drill into. No. So why was there this tension? What was going on? Why, why would they have done this? The professor said it was because they're anonymous posters. You want to give me campus. a chance to guess? Okay, guess. Well, I thought it was car parking. Or, Close uh, enough. Or a sociological dispute or- Well- Over, over uh, um, a lover. Car parking's the furthest away. Okay. So the other two are closer. He had uh, the sociology professor had proved God doesn't exist. No, no, he'd done that. They'd all done that. That's already right. that's already all known. Right. All right. So professor said there were these anonymous posters around campus that uh, quote portrayed him as an example of the species inter alios platonicus or silver tongued high priestly bird. Uh, uh, okay. Now of course we all know what that means. <laughs> No. I'm just thinking this no. the poster is it needs a little bit of a sociology degree to unpack. Yeah, not and a great poster. Not a great poster. Not a great poster. But apparently everyone in the department would have caught the reference to Gordner's recent book, oh. Enter Plato, Classical Greece and the Origins of Social Theory. Ah. I mean, duh. Everyone would have caught that if they'd read his book. I'm amazed you didn't. <laughs> you're quite a you're a well educated man. I, I think spoiler, uh the potentially <laughs> potentially sometimes the last people to read someone's book might be in the same department. Like they might it's be all like, I, I know you have a book. Congratulations on your book. Look at your cover. Your cover it's is a nice great. cover. But, I'll uh, put a copy on my shelf. Please give me a free version. 
The poster was, quote, satirical, if not exactly witty. And the quote runs about the bird. Given to nesting in high places, this raptorial bird may soar to great heights before diving to feed on carrion. He chews on thoughts only when personalities are not available. While devouring his prey, his song is said to be quite eloquent. So, you know, of course, if that had been about me, I would have been mortified. Sings nicely while chewing on the thoughts of yeah. of a student. Yeah. yeah, chews on thoughts only when personalities are not available. Now, that would take another three episodes to unpack what the I, fuck that means. I, I feel it, it is uh, It's mm. fairly niche. But these are late, you know, 1960s sociology types. Yeah, okay, okay. So why would someone put out this offensive piece of work? Gordner apparently had published an article in The American Sociologist, and he criticised the methods of some sociologists in their research on deviant behaviour. Mm-hmm. Not for doing deviant behaviour research, but their methods. It's a methods check. All right. Gordner, the professor, had suggested that these researchers were more interested in their own professional advancement than in the plight of the drug addicts and other deviates they studied, and that some of their methods were dishonest and immoral. To be cool. Okay. Okay. All right. You look more worried. No, I'm not. I'm not more worried. I'm the same worried I was before. <laughs> I, I, look, I just got to say, there's a little suspicion in my brain mm. that there might be some methods here where people are doing some form of research, taking them undercover in ways that- I don't know what you're talking about. I think you're reading too much into it. <laughs> so Humphreys apparently was mad, according to Gouldner. So the student was mad with the professor, according to the professor, because this was- an unfair personal attack on leading exponents of what some called underdog sociology. Oh, yeah. And also it was an oblique attack on certain members of the sociology department at the university, Washington University, including Humphreys, the student's advisor, Leo Rainwater. I feel like it's a made-up name or else it's indigenous and I take it back. That's great. I don't know. Um, Gouldner has all, had also called Humphreys a peeping parson. Mm-hmm. And said, look, the only reason you attacked me with these posters or whatever is because my, my article made you angry. Right, okay, okay. So after this uh, assault, Humphrey spent 24 hours in observation in hospital, but then he was out. And Gouldner, apparently at the time the uh, New York Times article was written, had a warrant issued against him charging him with assault with intent to do great bodily harm. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't find out whether he was actually convicted. I think he probably wasn't because the no, no story went further that said he was convicted. So it sounds like it was probably just just a mere beating without conviction. Oh. So the question is, why was there so much animosity? Was it just academics being, you know, precious little trinkets because, mm-hmm. you know, delicate feelings got hurt? Yep. What kind of deviant behaviour are we talking about in underdog sociology? And also, what did he mean when he called Humphreys a peeping parson? Ooh. Welcome. To the Wholesome Show, the podcast that loves to sneak a peek at the whole of science. We do. We do. I'm Will Grant. I'm a Roderick G. Lambert. Tell me about some underdogs. Oh, Underdog sociologists. So, Robert Allen Humphreys, the student. Yep. He was born in Oklahoma in 1930. So it was a while ago. His mother was called Stella, and that's all I know. Okay. His father was called Ira, and he was a wire chief for Southwestern Bell. So I assume that's something to do with telegraph wires or something. Southwestern Bell sounds like a Bell telegraph telephone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Wires. Wires. He was a wire chief. He was later elected to the Oklahoma House of Representatives. Cool. Yeah, you know, so it's Polly. And one source, I only found one source that said this, but they were pretty adamant. After Ira's death, Humphreys discovered that his politically reactionary father made regular trips to New Orleans to have sex with men. Providing okay. an example of secret homosexuals donning what Humphreys would many years later call the breastplate of righteousness. We'll get to that. It would be a troubling thing to discover. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or at least a know, surprise. Well, well, just in the sense of uh, having been lied to uh, throughout your life. Mm. Uh, but I know that there was more of the lying to back then about these things. Yeah, we don't lie these days. We, we bred that out of us in the 21st century. <laughs> uh, no. uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he found out after his father died that he was – taking side trips to, to dabble yeah. in ways that were not considered appropriate at the time. Well, even the dabbling. I think the, the, the side trips. Mm. Yeah. So Humphreys himself graduated from high school in 1948. He went to college in Colorado in 1952. Then he went to the Seabury Western Theological Seminary in 1955. 
Um, that's when he took on the name of Loud or Lord. Really? Yeah, L A U D though, not Lord as in L O R D. What does it mean then? Why is it? Why so say- it, I'll tell you. <laughs> from a, a chap called William Lord, who was a 17th century Archbishop of oh, so Canterbury. He's, he's doing like a Pope move. He's kind like, of, yeah. I yeah, am yeah. Benedict. I am. Yeah. I didn't think he did that after uh, out of the seminary. I, 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 he did because he be, he was an ordained as an Episcopalian priest in 55, and he took on Lord as his his priest name. Episcopalian priest what's, name. What's your priest name? Jesus. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> straight to Fuck it. Priest Jesus. Jesus. Father Jesus. Oh, Jesus. No, I, I Jesus. God. Fucking step it up. You just take it from me, Father you know? God. Because I do they Jesus. let you do that? Do they like? Is there a list in, and and there's for sure vetoes. You can't can't for have sure. can't have Hitler. Can't have Jesus. Can't have Father Buddha. That would be confusing. You certainly can't have the the M prophet. No, you can't. Can't. That, that's that. That would be confusing. That would be cheating, and also not God. I go straight to Jesus because you know why not. So he changes his name to Lord. Oh no, he adds it. So he becomes um, R. A. Lord Humphreys, and he's just commonly known as Lord Humphreys now. Okay, and I assume it's Lord, not Laud, because that would be too German. So he took that name in fifty five, became a priest. He worked in a bunch of parishes in Oklahoma, in Wichita, in Kansas, and apparently he riled up powerful members of the congregations with radical attacks on privilege, including racial privilege. Oh, that sounds good. So he's an outspoken he's, chappy he, who would. Yeah. Don't tell me he's going to turn into a baddie because I like I like this guy right now. I would never do that to you. So in 1960, five years later, Lord marries Nancy Wallace. You know, Nancy. And after then, he was then dismissed from Wichita, his post as a preacher dude. I don't know why. I assume he just pissed people off too much. He made the powerful feel sad or bad. So in 1965, he starts his PhD in sociology. Okay. Like he's a priest, but he, he lost his- He's a postless he lost priest. His, a postless a priest. priest. He lost his post. perch. Yep. Okay. So he's at the uni, Washington Uni in St. Louis- or St. Louis. So his research focuses on male-male sex in the St. Louis area public restrooms. So he's he's thinking, I want to know what dad was doing. I want to, I want to, I want to know. Yeah. And this is known in the in in the, as they put it, gay slang of the area that known as tea rooms. Tea rooms. Tea rooms. I haven't heard that term. Would you like a cup of tea? I would. Ah, it's not what I was expecting. Yeah, fair enough. Ultimately, his his PhD was published as a book in 1970 called Tea Room Trade, Impersonal Sex in Public Places. And it got a lot of attention. I, w- I was just wondering then how much coverage of this uh, this world had happened before. Oh, uh, look, not a shit ton. Or, yeah. and not in any other way other than, you know, the court reports. Yeah, 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 okay. Because, yep. you know, obviously you would be arrested for evil, I'm nefarious sure, behaviors. I'm sure, I'm sure. A lot. That was the most common offense people. And yeah, so super underground. I, I don't, I don't know yep. the law in, uh, law in America at the time, but I, I in that state definitely still new, new. illegal. Yeah. Illegal. But also it was in public. So double illegal, you know, you were in a public restroom. Yeah. 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 You're not behind closed doors. Nope. You're not at home. Yeah. So the book got a lot of attention. Some of it was very positive. So it won an award, the C Wright Mills award from the society for the study of social problems. Okay. That's cool. pretty cool. Yep. Some of it was, <laughs> Less positive? Is this attacking the book or the practices described in the book? Why just pick one? Yeah, okay. Why okay, pick one? Okay. Not, a, not only is the people hating on the practice, but also you shouldn't, you shouldn't study oh, yeah. this oh, and, and, and write a book on it. Any of those things. Don't do any of those. Some. Don't do any of those. And then some. <laughs> Thanks. You're Thanks. thinking too <laughs> narrowly. I, I always just love when people go, I am, I am so angry at this phenomena that I will attack anyone surrounding, even even if yep. they're neutrally trying to just yep. show that it happens. I don't want to know that it happens, and I don't want it to happen. No. And I don't want, and it to, I want to find to study out it. about it, it happening. I don't want anyone to find out nope. about it. I don't want to understand it. <laughs> Most common critiques seem to be, or outright denunciation, stemmed from the methods he used to get his data. Mm, okay. Okay. Cool. More on that in a minute. Oh. Um, so in 1970, uh, this is, you know, his book had been published that year. He got a teaching job in Southern Illinois University. So he's chugging along. In the middle of that year, or May that year, he led an anti-war demonstration and they invaded, as they put it, a draft office board, draft board office. Yeah. Okay. Makes more sense. Uh, Anti-Vietnam War. So yep. yeah, cool. Grumpy about the draft. And while he was, you know, busy in the office, um, he destroyed a picture of Richard Nixon. Okay. So you guessed Nixon would come in. I knew. Yeah, you, 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 you can't not. Um, this not only got him arrested, but it got him sentenced to 12 months in prison for destroying government property. Do you seriously get 12, 12 months, months, 12 for, months. It, for destroying a picture of Richard Nixon? Government property. Jesus. The fucking wank of it. Whoa. Yeah. And the whole point of the presidency system is you're not like a magic monarch nope. who is gifted by God to be there. Nope. 
Oh, but wow. a photo of you is oh, obviously a photo. Oh, yeah, go get fucked. I think is the down. Yeah, twelve months in prison. Yeah, but it's cool. It's cool because he did a plea bargain. So I mean, Richard said, Nixon's an asshole. Jesus, I'm just I'm just throwing the uh, people throwing the. I mean, it's you know, yeah, yeah. There's that parallel here of of. Uh, people stopping traffic on the Sydney Morning, uh, Sydney Morning Herald, on the Sydney, on the Sydney, 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 Herald, yeah. on the Sydney Opera, uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge. That's you got the there? one, the one where you drive and by across bridge in the you mean tunnel. No, not that. No, they did it on the bridge. Um, I thought it was in the tunnel. Maybe it was both. Uh, you can't, you can't stop traffic in the tunnel. That's dangerous. I am. <laughs> no, I mean, in the words of Nixon, I am not a. But happy. I, I look, look, whether it is, but 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 um, you know, climate protest mm. and and. People saying, oh, you, you, you can't interfere with people's way of life. And I love, you know, this way of life is people being in traffic. And it's yeah, like, yeah. You, know, you know, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Also, the point of protest is interference. <laughs> Jesus Just Christ. Call me picky. So um, it's cooler. He did a plea bargain and he served three months. Mm-hmm. This is mm-hmm. in 1972 he's doing this. But while he was I, in I jail. I guilty to poster destruction three yeah, months. Yeah, three months. I, I, I know someone else who was there. Three months worth of poster destruction yeah. rather than 12 months. Yeah. what if I admit it? I did it. Okay, three months in <sighs> fucking jail. Yeah. But while he was in jail, he was hired by Pitzer College. Oh? Yeah. And they are, they are one of the Claremont Colleges in Southern California. So they're a little consortium of seven colleges that basically – their mission says they're diverse characters, diverse in character, culture, blah, blah, blah. Basically, oh. they're the kind of hippie, integrative, we give a shit about humans and interesting ideas. But they're doing colleges. research. They're, they're like research Yeah, research yeah. teaching the whole thing. So, okay, cool. you know, so he gets hired while in jail, which I think is excellent. Hired while in jail to do what? Be a, Mark like some a, papers? No, a professor dude, like to be an academic. Can man. you teach from jail? Of course you can. You use 1972 Zoom. Yeah. He did, which yeah. is shouting through a can through a string. God damn though. If, if, if my professor was in jail, yeah. I would, I would turn up to those lectures, mm. I, you know, safely via zoom. Obviously, uh, obviously. I, w- I would be all over that. I, yes. I just like, yeah, I have jail professor. Yes. Cy- Cyrus, the virus is teaching me something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would be, or Nick Cage. That's my idea. It's going to be Nick, get put the body down. I, I am imagining <laughs> that's what's happening in jail. I'm going to be taught by this person. That's that so also cool. the buffest professor you've I ever had. I told you, I told you, this is why sociologists are the bikies of, uh, of the research world. I don't think he was in like the shittiest Alcatraz prison. I think he was what? probably in the prison farm prison what? or something. He's probably oh, making God. candle holders. Or no, no, no. I want sniffing patchouli oil and making pot pourri. <laughs> um, so yeah, he gets he gets hired while he's there. Is that, is that your imagination of what happens in in prison farm? They're making as far as they're I'm making concerned. potpourri. Potpourri. I, I hope so. <laughs> I, I, it's not organic. Vegetarian, delicious food. Except in Norway. All prisons in Norway are basically that. Yeah, they're better than being out of prison. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone says so. I'm going to Norway. Just a little Fuck, I hope I get jailed. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of it's garbage. So in 1972, while uh, he, he's, he's got his job, et cetera, which is great, um, he publishes a book called Out of the Closets, The Sociology of Homosexual Liberation, mm-hmm. which is one of the first scholarly accounts of the emerging gay lib movement. Can I just ask yeah. – um, He's married, isn't he? Yep. Two kids too. Okay. Is he of the community at all? <laughs> don't know. All right. Don't know. All right. All right. At this I, stage, I, it's unclear. I, I'll leave it with you at don't know. Yeah. I, I, at this stage, it's unclear. It could, it could be that he is or he isn't. <laughs> 1975, he issues uh, as issued. I don't know why they said issued in this sort. Two-year study, 111 uh, murdered homosexual men, I oh, believe it was all men. Jesus, yeah, yeah, right. And he concluded most of the killers were heterosexuals who had a fear or a hatred of homosexuality. Mm. So that's tops. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, yeah. I don't know if you're going to cover this, but the number of the number of those murders mm. that just went unexamined, uh, unprosecuted. Got what they the, deserved attitudes, yeah, and, yep. And police around the world, I mean, I know here in Australia, but I know in other countries, yep. just, just, oh, no, we, we, whatever, you know. I'm not saying they had it coming, but, you know, they had it coming. Yeah. Oh, Fucking assholes. I, I, I can't believe that. We weren't great. We haven't really done systematic inquiries. I mean, probably needed to do it 20 years ago. Uh, yeah, or 50. Seeing as that, yeah, yeah, I know, but yeah. Not so easy, a lot not of those, easy then. Yeah. A lot of those cops are probably dead now. But Jesus, those cultures. Mm. It's not great. So that was a, another one of his studies, which, you know, is a big deal, 75. But the biggest splash was the Tea Room Trade Book. That was the thing that really yeah. gained attention. So let's talk about that. So the full name of the book again, Tea Room Trade, Impersonal Sex in Public Places. Impersonal, because they're quick hookups. Yeah, 
impersonal, okay, in the sense of, you know. You, you don't know the person. Yeah, sure. Dispersonal. It's still the person. We're still, we're still personing each other. That's true. If you don't know someone, that doesn't mean they ain't yeah, people. Yeah, like uh, anonymous, I'd take. Uh, or. I don't know if it's anonymous because they could low, see each other. Low conversation. But we're not talking glory holes. We're talking fully visible. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but, well, okay. So, so to each other. I mean, but, you know, they don't know each other's life story. It's, that's true. I think that's what I mean by impersonal. Like the, the point is to, to have a route and that's it. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's it. No other detail. So according to this very official source, and I, I, I delved into more official sources, I think, than I ever have for an episode before. Tea Room Sex, a.k.a. fellatio in public restrooms. No, you've got to talk that in normal words. Fellatio. I just think fellatio is such a funny word. I don't care what it is. It's People just People need to understand what you say, though. Fellatio. That's for the Australian audience. Fellatio for the posh uh, Kiwis. And Americans, uh, blowjobs. Thank you. So apparently this is this tea room sex accounted for the majority of homosexual arrests in the United States, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. When people were busted, it was usually for in, impersonal sex in public places. Because, you know, a, 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 it's crime and it shouldn't be, but but, but yeah. because it's out in public and it's yeah. a place where police can police. And look, one of the arguments was, well, but it's in public, so, you know, poor innocents could stumble upon it mm. and therefore, oh, you know, uh, corrupting uh, the yeah, universe. Yeah, yeah. So Humphreys recognised that the public and law enforcement authorities and really all of society – had really simplistic views and stereotype beliefs about men who, as they put it, commit impersonal sexual acts with one another mm. in public restrooms. Mm. So he realised that it would be of considerable importance if society gained more objective understanding. Like, let's just work out what's going on here. <sighs> Who's there doing what and why and where, who are they? Where, whether we are judging or not, let's, let's understand Let's personalise them. Let's yeah. make them humans, not dirty buggers who hide yeah, out yeah, in yeah, toilets. Yeah. And so he wanted to know, ultimately, you know, like why are these dudes motivated to seek quick, impersonal sexual gratification? They just want to have a bit of sex and leave. Yep. In and out, get on with how, it. How could, what, what could possibly be their reason? Impossible to know. Yeah. So that's why he did his PhD research that turned into the book, Tea Room Tray. Let's have a look at the methods. Mm-hmm. See, see he, 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 to me right now, he sounds like a good guy. He, he killed a picture of Richard Nixon. Yep. Went to jail for yep. it. He's protesting. He's uh, mm. – he's, Shining light on pre- on uh, an area of society that uh, needs protection. And, Why would and, he not continue to be a good guy? Threatening me with this methods thing. Told you nothing. <laughs> I just mentioned methods and waggled my hand. Tell me what he did. Two phases. One was participant observation. Uh, the other was structured interviews. Mm-hmm. Phase one. He stationed himself in tea rooms um, and he, he offered to, to serve as the watch queen Okay. Which is the person who basically keeps watch and coughs or make noises just to let people who are waiting for whatever know that maybe a police person is here or new people are turning up. Just like <clears throat> someone yeah. coming. Be, yeah, yeah. Be, be aware. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Be aware. The lookout. Yeah. And he, would, he passed himself as a voyeur, which is, in this case, one who derives sexual gratification from observing the sex acts of he Passed others. himself off as or? He said to them that's what he was. I'm a voyeur. I like to watch. So he was allowed to watch acts that occurred in the bathroom stalls that didn't have doors. Did he, did he identify what he might be doing? Uh, did he have a typewriter with him? <laughs> yes, on a string around his neck. <laughs> a little, or a little uh, uh, clip in his hat that yeah. says uh, yeah. press. Press, extra, uh, extra. Journalist. Out of the way, man, press. No, he didn't do that. Um, he said, I'm a voyeur and I'll be the watch queen. I, I dig watching, thanks for that, and I'll keep lookout. Uh, okay. And he gathered data, like on the locations it happened, the frequency of the acts. Sure. The age of the men, the roles they played, whether you were, you know, top, bottom, up, down, whatever, and where the money changed hands. Oh, okay. I don't think it commonly did, but they, that, the details. But he's gathering that. He's, he's gathering all this data. He also never disclosed his role as a researcher. <sighs> PhD researchers. Do. Just, just, you know. Do, 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 do that. You yeah. know, you know. I, I get there might be times when you can't tell, you know, you're, you're observing a crowd. Like you're, you're yeah. out, in, out in public and you want to see how crowds move. Well, you're in 8,000 minutes. Excuse me, I just want to let you know I'm a researcher. Yeah, 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 Excuse yeah, me, I want to. Yeah. Yeah. We can't do everything. All, but no. but this, is, this is a scenario where there's not very many people and it doesn't hurt to just. Who, who are we to judge? Oh, yeah, academics uh, who do research yeah, yeah, and ethics yeah. committee members. Yeah. Um, but he, apparently he did play the role of watch queen mostly faithfully, like he did the job. He didn't okay. just say he would so be, he is, didn't. At least that part of the transaction he is doing. He's not, he's not, yeah. he's not secretly whistling the cops or anything like that. Yeah. Oh no, he's not doing that. He's okay. not. He's not getting these dudes in trouble. He he was mostly playing the role of the watch queen. Well, but there was a moment in phase two where maybe that may have wobbled a bit. We'll get to that in a tick. Uh, right, right. 
Um, so he basically gained the confidence of, of some of the men he observed. He, he then told them he was a scientist and right. he persuaded them to tell him about the rest of their lives and their motives, etc. Close. After. Close. But yeah. But not quite that. Some of them. Some of them. And it was worth noting, though, apparently that m- most of them who were prepared to talk about it tended to be among the, as they put it, better educated members of the tea room trade. So the folks who were more aware of the signals, the, the habits, the practices, can, the I culture, etc. I can spot this guy as some yeah, sort of – Yeah. Yeah. So that's phase one. Phase two, follow-up interviews. So he realized this is a bias sample. Just, I'm just, I'm just, just yeah. pausing for a second yeah. and, and recognizing how vulnerable these people are mm. in the sense that not only, not only with the police, mm. um, with violent homophobes around, yep. and also potentially I imagine many of them are in heterosexual relationships as well. Uh, and and yeah. and and that there is an element to this that is is all clandestine. Like, they, they, Not they, an element. It, it just is. <laughs> it just, <laughs> it yeah. just is. Yeah. And 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 how you know they they are so vulnerable pe- yeah. here. Potentially very much so. In in this time in in particular. Uh, look, especially there's no there's no question. So in phase two, he he realized he wanted to quote avoid bias. So this is where he may have you know shirked his duties a bit at the, as the watch screen because he'd pop out and record the license plate numbers of the people who are busy. <laughs> okay, why? So then it seems, and I'm not sure if this is common practice or if he had a buddy in the police. Oh, is he doing like a social network study? He's like, he's like, I can- Yeah, not I that can, sophisticated. Yeah, I can, I can spot these license plates today and then these ones today. Ah, uh, see, this is a sweetly naive and, and very ethical view. Mm. <laughs> he went to a buddy in the police force or oh, maybe- no. Got their addresses. No, no, no. Oh, I mean, it's just, that's just good investigative. Also, just, can I just – going to your buddy in the police force. Well, look, I assume it was a buddy. It was very ambiguous, but it seems like it was easy to find this out. I, 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 know, that, I know that um, we've been told by all of the cop shows that if you just need, you got a buddy, you just call up, yeah. can you just run a plate for me, you know? I'm a, I'm a PI. I got a ma- I used to be yeah, in the police. You know, One of know. them still likes me. I, I've watched a cop show. Can I, can I just run some plates, Can you please? run the plates? Exactly. I think it was even less difficult. <laughs> but it also sounds like they're bored and they're just like, sure. Fuck like, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sitting here at my computer. Like, do, I, do you want to know why? What I the, love nah, running whatever. plates. Do you want some more plates yeah. while I'm here? Yeah. I, I'll, I'll identify all of them. I, I, don't, I don't know what these 1968 computers were like. But There's only like two number plates back there. Filing cabinet. He's going through the, the cards. <laughs> so, yeah, he found out their addresses, which is cool because he was planning to do interviews with them. <laughs> Twelve months later, he turns up at their house. Oh, no. He claims to be a health service interviewer, <laughs> and he asks some questions about you know, marital status, race, job, et cetera. You know, you know, you know, you got to like go slow on this because you know as – you imagine as a researcher, you're like, this is a detective story. Mm-hmm. I, I want to understand um, – this this issue, this thing yeah. in society, I want to understand what's going on, and, yeah. and and I can see all of the leads in front of me. I will follow all of the leads. Yep. Just, you turn up at someone's house, but but see, so, you know, there was a concern that if people recognise him, if he turned up, they might be freaked, like he's going to blackmail me, all that oh, sort of yeah. stuff. Well, you, yeah. So he thought about that. Legitimate concern. He thought about that. He's not a monster. Okay. How so did he, he solve it. He disguised himself. He changed his <laughs> hair colour and drew, wear different clothing. <laughs> I, I really, I really thought he was going to fake moustache. Fake moustache. Fake moustache. That's what. That's what. All I, I had. The image in my head was when Cartman is trying to act like a grown up, and he's standing on the on the shoulders of two other South Park kids in a giant great coat with a huge moustache. Going, excuse me, sir. <laughs> I've come here to represent. I, 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 researchers, researchers out there. You know, if if you're in this moment where you're suddenly like, okay, okay, I, I need a disguise. Slow down. Pause for a second. And think, and, why? <laughs> really, at this point. Talk to a few people. You're like, if just just go through this process. If I need a disguise, dot dot dot. <laughs> I, I do like. Then there must be some legitimate occasions in which a researcher is allowed to wear a disguise. Mm. The I'm, effect of disguises on apes. Nice, nice. I've dressed up as an ape. Can yep. you tell if I'm an ape or not? Yep. As a supervisor of researchers, just loving the idea that someone would say, "Okay, so stage one, I will wear a disguise." <laughs> like, yeah. Phase two, <laughs> aren't you worried they might be scared you're going to blackmail them? Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I've got a plan. I'm going to dye my hair magenta and I'm going to wear a flamboyant vest. Do you know? I mean, they'll never I, I, mean, I, mean me. I dream of a world where where we can be weirdo researchers, where Fuck we're yes. doing that kind of stuff. Yes. It's like, it's like uh, you know, what was the story of, you told ages ago of, of um, 
Newton, Isaac Newton going undercover as a coin detective. Yeah, and, a, and, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. He was like, against forges. Yeah, exactly. I, like, yeah. I'm, I, am, I am so down with that for the fun of it. <laughs> but there's boundaries. Wait, aren't you Isaac Newton? No, he does not have this glorious moustache. <laughs> I could be anybody. <laughs> Nay, sir. Isaac Newton is a clean shaven gentleman. I, I, I look. I know. I, I, I want to wear more disguises in my job. Of course you do. <laughs> I remember, like this is many, many years ago. I, I, yeah. tr I tried out for a spy agency, and uh, I think they saw me walk in the door and they're like, "Not you, buddy." No, nope. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> look at you. No. Here's part of the problem. The moment you walked in, everyone looked at you. <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> I'm here to spy. I'm here to spy. <laughs> Look, yeah, I'd be the same. I recognise that um, it's not your fault, man. It was not a good fit. No, it was not a good fit. No. It was. It was. It's not them. It's not the. It's not me. It's not me. It's not them. It's I, I, different you know, paths, man. You're just it's, on different exactly, paths. Exactly. But <laughs> <laughs> you're walking in, swirling your cane. You know, you know, all our knowledge is to know thyself, and it's like yeah. there's a nice bit of learning. So he did all that, and he does say, "Oh, look, I was very careful to change my appearance, dress, and my automobile from the days when I was passing as a deviant." Uh, okay, it's cool. So what did he find? He did all this research. What did he find? It destroyed stereotypes very quickly. So this research destroyed stereotypes about what kinds of people or what kinds of men were participating in the tea room business. So the stereotype before was like- Dirty, gay, deviant well, probably people gay. who were horrible. I get the gay. No, not necessarily. What, what's, our, what's our separation here? So there's this, and we, we have this now today as well, the, the, the men who have sex with men but don't identify as gay and, and otherwise live so, so gay heterosexual be, gay lives. gay being identification, whereas men-, men well, Also preference, with, I just want to have sex with dudes, whereas a but, lot but, of But men who have, have sex way. with men being a behaviour rather than-, rather and, than and a, so, yeah. so, so we're, we're examining, recognising the difference between behaviour and identification. Uh, yep. And indeed the, the rest of the lifestyle too. So- just over half, 54% were married. They lived with their wives. That's what I thought, yeah. And they were, on superficial analysis, exemplary citizens with exemplary marriages. Happy marriages? Exemplary marriages. That's the only language they used. So, so a 1970s marriage, which, which, which I assume included happy marriages. No, totally happy because they're always exactly. stoned I, and you could bang anyone I, at I, those parties in the sunken lounge rooms with the coffee tables mm, that also had pot plants in them. Not everyone Not everyone in the 70s got to have it. You, do you remember those were the fashion forward houses of the 1970s? Yes. A lot of people were still living in the late 1940s houses. That, that no, no, we had the terrarium coffee table and everything was pottery and wood pan fake wood panelling. Fucking awesome. So beautiful. I still love it. Uh, I like the sunken lounge room. Oh, oh, my. I'd have one tomorrow <laughs> with the thick fuzzy uh, carpet. Oh. You know they're so, oh. dumb. they're so dumb. They're so dumb architecturally. But the idea that, you know. We Fabulous. Just, we just have a, there's a lounge. It's like a dry spa. Let us lounge. Yeah. yeah, dry spa. I step down into my dry hot tub. Dry spa is not a great term though. Doesn't sound great. I No, no. I'm, Five bucks for dry spa. Like if, if, if you're at a real estate. Uh, listings and this house includes dry spa. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what do we need? They sound like freaks will murder me but, if I turn but up. But sunken lounge, I, I do want to see Love some it. some future. You know, well, as in like a a current house builder going. Yes, here is the sunken lounge. This I'd build one. It, I'd, I'd do it. Don't work with robot vacuum cleaners. I don't care. I don't mind vacuuming. That's when I listen to podcasts. Just like you, listener. So. Turn, remember to turn on your noise cancelling. Thirty eight percent were clearly quote neither bisexual nor homosexual. So there's 54% clearly, who- cl Hang on. So we're clearly neither. That's what they said. They weren't bisexual or homosexual. So clearly, I assume, heterosexual. Here's how they so were described. So clearly identifying as, as heterosexual. Yeah. Well, as best as I could tell. Here's how they're described. There are men whose marriages were marked with tension. Most were Catholic or their wives were. And since the birth of their last child, the quote was, conjugal relations had been rare. Yeah. So- at least half of us is Catholic. We've had kids. Why would you sex anymore? There's there's things to unpack in there. There really are. And they, they of course, they still wanted to have the sex. And what they needed as an alternative apparently was it had to be quick, inexpensive, and impersonal, just like get in and get it done. Mm -hmm. So they didn't want any kind of involvement that would threaten their, as it was put, already shaky marriage and jeopardize their most important so asset, they, their standing as a father. So so they, they don't want to risk – their, their marriage, their house, their, yeah. their fatherhood, no. those kind of things. So, yeah. they're, so they're, they're invested in their their public life, they're not, they're, yep. they're most of their life. 100%. And they're looking for a, a form of sex that uh, doesn't cost, doesn't come with complications, doesn't yeah. come it's with- quick. And the language is basically, 
this is a nice phrase. They wanted some form of orgasm producing action that was less lonely than beating off well, and less involved in a love relationship. It's a bit judgmental. You don't have to be lonely when you beat off. I mean, just do it at work like a normal person. Or as or as the uh, the Proud Boys say, you can beat off if if you're within nine feet of a consenting woman. Within nine feet of a consenting woman. Nine feet or more or nine feet or less? <laughs> nine feet or more is not a thing. Or it's just like- <laughs> nine feet. Exactly nine feet. Otherwise, not touchy. <laughs> I think it's nine feet. Anyway. Exactly nine feet. Yeah. Just yeah. under three metres. <laughs> then you are allowed. So of the other 62%, the ones who were neither bisexual nor homosexual, um, close to half of them were clearly bisexual. They were happily married. They were well educated. They were economically well off. Exemplary members of their community, but they were, they were bisexual. In, can, can we just clarify here? Mm. In in the sense of publicly identifying, or uh, I'm not sure whether publicly because it uh, wasn't the time to be uh, doing that. But I assume this is this is taken from interviews and and chats. So I, I'm just I, I'm I'm I get that um, the terms that we use change over time because yeah. of the ways we think about different sexualities and the yep. laws around them. Yep. Um, and there's, you could, pro- you could probably characterize this as public facing and private. And, mm. and, and it, so, so in that sense, are we saying the first group are not really into men, men having sex with men. They're not really into men, no. but they're looking for, um, they're looking for the quick or- orgasm. Yeah. Second group here, they're into men, but they're also into women. Well, so, h- half of that second group, roughly, a <laughs> bit less than half, yeah. were into both. Yeah, okay. Or both at the time. I know there are other versions. Um, the same amount, so 24% of the 62%, so nearly half of, uh, sorry, a quarter, doesn't matter. A smaller group again, they were single and they were covert gay, covert homosexual, and only 14% of the whole lot would, as they put it, correspond to society's stereotype of homosexuality. They were members of the gay community and they were interested primarily in homosexual relationships. So these are the people that would publicly identify yeah, and they're at like, the time. As I, I want to be with another guy. That was yeah, yeah. It's 14% of all the people uh, in the study. I, I'm, I'm fascinated to understand how these people correlate with um, our current communities yeah. because obviously, obviously there remain some uh, covert uh, covert for, for different sorts of yep. reasons, yep. Uh, people that are gay. But we have so many more people that are like you know, publicly and that and that's all <laughs> yeah. so different to the world back then. Entirely. And so this, of course, this was these results were humongous in the early 70s, yeah, like no mind-blowing. Yeah, I get it. Do you want to know how it was received? Uh, <laughs> responses. Oh, God. Oh, God. So immediate straight-up responses. Obviously ethics may have come into it. Oh, my God. Yeah, okay. So serious questions Show around- Show us your disguises. Yeah. Well, false pretense is obviously phase one, just lying, or not, or rather not declaring that you were doing research. Yeah. And also there was then in phase two, implicit coercion, because he's going after uh, back a year later, basically I saw you doing things that you mm-hmm. might not want to be identified as doing, and I found you through your license plate numbers. Well, and while he may think he's not doing that, he is doing that. Yeah, with, uh, uh, look, he certainly didn't intend to. Can it's you imagine? Clear. Yeah, didn't intend to. Didn't intend can you to. imagine the knock on your door yeah. and you're like, wh- where do I me- remember you from? And you know how you see someone out it's of context? It's impossible to remember him because the hair's different colour. Like you see someone New from, jacket. You see someone from work down at the beach and you're like, suddenly I can see your nipples. And it's it's very different. It's 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 very different. Keep talking. And it takes a little while to go, who are you again? You're, yeah. oh, it's the thingy right. project. I normally uh, see you with pants. Yeah, exactly. But it yeah. uh, yeah. takes a little while. Mm. I imagine mm. it would be horrifying to react that way. Yeah, there were there were issues. But it turns, look, I mean, this is no surprise to anyone who is us, at least. There weren't any ethics committees back then or institutional review boards, as the US calls them. So the proposal for his research was only reviewed by his PhD committee. And the other members of the department only heard about it after it was done. Oh, oh, they didn't do some sort of, uh, pre- nope. this is what I'm going to do? No. Uh, cool, cool. Apparently not. Cool, look what I did. Look what I did. Uh- yeah. Look at my student did. So you'd be amazed to hear that there was a bit of a, a furor. Mm. People were very mad. They said he unethically evaded the privacy of people, threatened the social standings of, uh. of and they still called them subjects then, of course. Oh, still. So these folk petitioned the president of the university to rescind his PhD. It didn't happen, but that was the petition. Um, it also, apparently, as it was put, there, there were numerous other unfortunate events as a result of the turmoil, including a fistfight among faculty members, and about half of them left. 
They said, shit, we're out of here. Wow. Yeah. Half of them. But seriously, you've tainted the school so much. Yeah, or the way it was handled and they couldn't keep their name mm, attached to it. Yeah. The chancellor was outraged and sought to have his degree revoked on the grounds that observing sexual felonies was also a felony. I, you know, I, 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 I'm not with you, Ch- Chancellor. I think the, the lack of ethics in doing it. So he kept his degree, but the, the chancellor managed to hold up a major institutes of National Institute of Mental Health grant that went to his supervisor. So right I'm going to go slow. Yeah, fuck I'll up hold it up. Yeah. I'll hold it up. This will teach you. Well, they say hold up, and I think that might mean stopped, but it's not clear oh. from the sources I read. So deception, of course, was a big issue. This is, a, you know, one of the, the big sort of pushbacks. And there's a, a long article which is in the show notes by a guy called Earl Babby who talks a lot. There's a lot of articles that go back and refer to or unpack what this study meant yeah. and the implications do you, do you and know, so forth. You know, I bet, I bet you could do this research back then mm. ethically. You could absolutely go and say, hands up. I, I am I am a friend to the community and yeah. I, would, I, would, I would like to understand more so that the rest of society can understand more. Can I talk to you? Can I whatever? You yeah. know, they're, if they're, they're, say no, you work <clears throat> it out. Exactly, exactly. They're, they're, it's not like it would have been impossible to, no. to do this in a way that is ethical, even in a time when, when the practices are illegal. I, I would have thought. So obviously, Babby and others, is, he's reflecting the views of many folk. Uh, deceiving subjects is always an ethical issue, but we should probably you know, level with people if we can. And the bigger issues that he unpacks are, you know, does the research actually justify the deception? And if it does, Mm. will the people be hurt by the deception? So these are fair questions. Is is, is there a justification and will people get hurt? And we would ask these questions today. Yep. Then after it's done, you would ask whether the potential value was actually realised and whether subjects were actually hurt. Fair questions. Mm. Babby's conclusions though. So a number of ethical issues that are still agonised over today were brought up by this issue by this situation. And he reckons it's more important that we grapple with them than come up with pat answers that don't process context and detail. And I'm torn on that because I can see that sometimes it's, it's important to have codes, but maybe if we just follow, as he puts it, established canons of ethics, they degenerate into ritualism. So you don't start to consider the nuances. That's, uh, that's what he's arguing. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know if that, it's true. I just no. He wants to get a bit excited. He wants to get a bit too loosey goosey. Maybe maybe codes give you some guidelines. And if we suddenly discover there's a moment where we go, okay, there's a question yeah. the code doesn't answer. Yeah. Or maybe the code might be wrong. Let's have a chat. Absolutely. But let's 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 not throw out codes and say we can do it all ourselves. Or yeah. Look, and it seems he's got somewhere in the middle. And look, I take his point. And he says also, of course, this is a great case to use for students to say, okay, let's pull it apart. And see yeah, what totally. The most publicised objection was violation of privacy. No surprises. <clears throat> So there was a journalist called Nicholas von Hoffman, and so some of the people in the sociology department who were pissed off fed him information about this very quickly. They went like, look what happened, this is garbage, we hate the way they've handled it, fuck this. So he was very loud about his critique, and he said in an article, we're so preoccupied with defending our privacy against insurance investigators, dope sleuths. I I was not going to assume that's who we're defending our- Dope sleuths. (laughs) Dope dope sleuths, is that like- Cops looking for if you're smoking the cones? I, I'm going to say yes. That's very – and insurance people? Yeah. Counter-espionage men. <laughs> he's, defend- gone, he's gone to a bunch of weird things that reveal something interesting about his life. Divorce detectives? Yeah, okay. Well, I, yeah. Credit checkers. <clears throat> we're, so, we're so obsessed with that that we forget to, over, to look into social scientists behind it's- their hunting blinds. <sighs> there you who go. Are, who are peeping into what we thought were our most private and secret lives. Mm. But there they are, studying us, taking notes, getting to know us, as indifferent as anybody else to the feeling that to be a complete human involves having an aspect of ourselves that is unknown. And he's outraged mm. by these sociological snoopers. Yeah. And th- that got a lot of traction. Yeah, exactly. A lot of traction. I, no, look, an aspect of ourselves that we all should get to choose our privacy. Like, mm. like th- th- we all have public and private lives and we should get to choose. Not me, I'm an open want. book, but most people. Reactions from the tea room and wider similar communities, so people more broadly and more closely associated. Some are upset because they thought the, these public ha- these findings that were published in a paperback, so very accessible, presented the average man with a how-to manual. Oh, how-to. How to – Oh. Because there's a, there's a very rich no. code of behaviours to make sure there are no mistakes made. I, I assume – Oh, so, so there must have been hundreds of thousands, if not millions, millions. of men who – Billions of American men. In, indeed, indeed, uh, who, who were thinking – 
God, I want to go and do some tea room, yeah. but I have no idea. I don't know, how, I don't know what the rules are. I, I don't know. I, Here it, we go. It would be impossible to know this unless I found a book. And, and look, I, I know I know mm. that there actually are some nervous Nellies about a whole bunch of things who would say, don't know what you're talking about. I, I'd, I'd like to read a book before I go, go and do that thing. And uh, <laughs> well, Look, in this instance, it seems reasonable too because there really is quite an elaborate code because sure. they want to make sure that no one is accidentally- Yeah, a cop. In, or, no, also, just if a dude's just gone in there to have a poo- yeah, sure, sure. You don't want to immediately go, how about a blowjob uh, too? And he's like, no, seriously, I just want to have a poo. No, no, exactly. So it, there's code it, it, and it, movements it, and signals. It is it is yeah. not quite a secret society, but it's, it is a secret community yeah. where absolutely there are codes that are designed to protect people and keep protect things quiet. Protect everyone involved. However, everyone however involved. It, it is also, I assume, a community that does recognize they need to, you know, get welcome new people. Yeah, and I don't know how that works. Impossible to know. But I don't, I mean, met you walk up and go, is this tea room? I don't think that would work so well. Maybe it would. But, but, but maybe I think I'd feel extra weird if I've got the paperback book in my pocket and I'm going, flicking through like a translator. Okay. First, knock three times. Yeah. <laughs> Rub the bottom of the store with the left hand, not the right hand. It gets very elaborate. So there was some concern. Of course, there was a lot of the accusations, they blur. It's hard to say distaste with the subject matter in general. How dare you research something so disgusting? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, you know, and, and as one author puts it, you know, he wasn't just studying sex, but, you know, observing and discussing homosexuality and not people in caring relationships, homosexual or otherwise, but, you know, daring to just go and have a root. Are, are we saying they're not caring? At no point did you say they're not caring? Allegedly. Allegedly. You said they're interper- uh, impersonal. No, I'm not saying it. This is uh, yeah, one, okay. of, one of the many yeah, authors. Yeah. They're, uh, they're not happy. And they, and they were saying also that perhaps if, if this research had been done on – because of the outcry, but what if the research had been done the same way but on members of the KKK or a flying saucer cult or whatever – they, they, the people who are saying the subject matter bothered people more than the, um, the way it was done suspect that if it wasn't on such a publicly distasteful mm. set of behaviours that maybe that wouldn't have been so beaten up and abused. But at the time, homosexuality was a big deal. So positives. There was um, an informal inquiry that was published about 1970. So it suggested that, Humph- that Humphrey's research had helped persuade police departments to stop using their resources to arrest people in a victimless crime. Like, Stop busting people for this, you assholes. Um, and this research seemed to, anecdotally at least, have contributed to that. And many within the gay community also welcomed it because a lot of police districts, it, they showed decreased raids and way less arrests for sodomy. But really? So, yeah. so after this, the police backed off a bit? Well, they became a bit more... In some areas. These are, these well, the are, police may have been directed to. Okay. But, but, but they went from... You know, stereotypes of yep. you know the, the, yep. they're horrified stereotypes to yep. okay. There's 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 normal people in, in some s- of these folks are actually okay. Some, some of these so folks are folks. Yep. Yeah, okay. Well, well, look, not perfect, but the like it still dehumanizes at least some of the you know the subset. But at least the the broader benefits are everyone maybe got a little less persecuted and you know bashed. And look, many would say this is a social benefit. And look, look loud loud himself, Mister Humphreys, sorry, Doctor. He said it was good because his study and other people reported on this, it, it dispelled the myth that the men he was studying were dangerous social deviants. Now, I have mixed feelings about this because apparently this was good because, quoting, he found that most were married to women and had children. Only 14% were exclusively homosexual oh. and identified as gay. So only 14% so it's okay, are uh, evil social deviant. Yeah, so look, pros and cons on that. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, we're getting some of the way, but not all of the Don't way. Don't worry, it's okay. They're not all horrible, pervy, nasty folk, you know, like. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. D- d- look, not perfect, not perfect. On a journey, mm-hmm. I think there's a step in the journey, mm-hmm. but it certainly didn't get to the final Could, could have gone further. Also, Lord himself, he wasn't a monster. Like, he recognised the need to protect the confidentiality of his data. Okay. He never published anything that included identifiers. He protected his notes carefully. When um, He also said he knew that he was observing illegal behaviour so that if he was subpoenaed, he might have been arrested and imprisoned for refusing to hand them over. Okay. And he said he'd always assumed he would refuse, but after he'd spent some time in jail after smashing up Tricky Dicky's picture, he sort of doubted how long he'd be able to hold out because prison sucked. I'm sure. So he's realistic about that. He's like, I'm uh, sure, but- I try- I, I'm not sure that we're, we're into the level in 70s America of torturing people for number plates. I don't know. No, for trashing, tricky. I, I, for, for finding, no, for refusing to expose data that would. Yeah, I know, but the number plates is the data. Yeah. Well, no, the whole files. After he'd done yeah. the interviews, he would have tried to keep those protected. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it was, it was a, an issue. 
legacy-wise, as you kind of suspected, Lord was actually a gay man. I, I didn't. I were you asked? Like, I wondered. Yeah. yeah. So he was actually a gay dude, but at the time when he was doing this work, he was married with kids, and he wasn't out. So, so he would in those categorizations, he would put himself in the. It's hard, hard to know how these categorize, but he he sexually attracted to men. Yeah. and wanted to publicly yeah, actually get, get to a public not, place. Not bisexual. So not like bisexual and not that group of people that yeah. were heterosexual but looking for release. Mm-hmm. Yep. So he was, he, he was a gay man. He is well, – oh, he was. He's dead now. He yep. was a gay man. But at the time he was doing it, as I said, he was married, he had kids, and he was living in a world where that would have been less easy to be. So 1974, he's at the annual meeting of the American Sociological Association, and there was a session on labelling. And there was a speaker called Edward Sagarin – who apparently published a lot of um, homophile advocacy, so, you know, pro stuff under a fake name. Homophile? You don't- homophile advocacy was the term used. I know. Uh, okay. But he was, he was criticizing sociologists for hiding behind the safety of their wives and children whilst advocating that lesbians and gay men came out of the closet. You say, you hypocrites. You're hiding behind your stuff and you're saying other people should come out. Okay, and he was grumpy about this. Potentially, some of them might be heterosexual, but saying people, could, if if uh, if he, we could be nice to everyone, that's yeah, no, not he, a crime. He, he was just like, look, look, you fucking yeah, okay, wusses, okay, okay, come okay. out, yeah. stop, stop hiding behind your wives and children. So, Lord had been in that room, and he just he figured that because he dedicated Tea Room Trade to his wife and children, the mm-hmm. book, maybe Sagarin had him in mind as one of yeah, these yeah, people yeah. who was hiding. So there was a, a formal discussion section, and he very clearly said. I don't want to be accused of hypocrisy and duplicity. I'm a gay dude. So he came out and made came it very out, clear. Came out in a book. Now, my, my suspicion, it seems like that was where he first properly came out, but yeah. I, I'm not positive. Jeez. That's what it seems I mean, like. What a, what a, I mean, you hear, you know, the, the stories of coming out are very still, obviously, and, <laughs> um, and in general are probably getting easier. Um, mm. ki- younger kids these days and things like that in general, but obviously not exclusively. Never perfect, but yeah. my God, you know, coming out in such a public manner, like you have to come out in a, uh, a giant forum like I mean, that in the seventh. For him though, at least it wouldn't have people would have, I don't think people would have gone, I had no idea that at least would have gone. All right. I'm not surprised given the work you've done. Just to pause for a second. You're going to cover the the psychiatry guy. No, that's not part of this. Yeah, but I know the one. But you but mean. but yeah. well, yeah, you know, but but the idea of taking uh, homosexuality, as it was described back then, out of the DSM, whatever number they were up to at the time, three, whatever, two or three, and yeah. um, so a psychiatrist, you know, I can't, I don't have his name right in front, of it, and and yeah. and literally wore a mask to the American Psychological Psychiatric Association, uh, Association yeah. meeting and said we should we should decriminalize and take it out of the the DSM, and so the idea that. I need to I need to do this with a mask on because yeah. because I among I, psychiatrists yeah. for fuck's sake. Well, it was, it was criminal. So I know, but it's yeah. uh, man. no. I, that, that would have been it's, mm. you know that would have been such a rabbit hole. So as an uh, the aftermath of that presentation, the whole you know getting mm. mad with people and stuff. So the sociologist gay caucus was created, and it went on to become sociologist gay lesbian caucus, sociologist gay lesbian bisexual and transgender caucus. So yep, it's yep, yep. evolved with the times. And, and um, Humphreys was one of the active founding members. He was on the steering committee, et cetera. And so his publications helped legitimize gay and lesbian studies within sociology, at least in America, and challenge the notion of homosexuality as deviance. So good results again. Yeah. This is why his stuff is kind of confusing. Oh, of course. Of course. Like – Helpful. If, if, you, if you take the, uh, the end justifies the means – And look, uh, I, I haven't – I didn't see a lot in rummaging around through this um, – of people saying there was uh, participants and subjects stories about them feeling terribly damaged. I don't know if they don't. They might exist, but I didn't. They, they didn't come up in these searches, which yeah. surprised me. Well, nothing I mean, came up. They wanted to stay quiet. Yeah, but so. yeah, well, and this is one of the arguments that said you know more harm was caused by making such a furore about the actual study, letting people know these lists exist, etc. Mm-hmm. That might have caused potentially more harm to participants than sorry, I should say subjects. They're not participants yet. So anyway, 1975, Lord becomes a full professor of sociology. Well done, him. 1980, he leaves his wife and his two children to live with his protege, Brian Miller, who was a grad student at University of Alberta. So, Could, could we use another word than protege? Well, I, I could, but that's what the sources say. It's protege. Just, I, it's just not the most equal of 
Well, he was a grad student and Lord was a professor, so not the most equal. <laughs> no bashings at least. Oh, my God. So basically, he, yeah, he hooked up – no, that's not fair. He, he went into a relationship with this guy, Brian Miller. He became, in 1980, the same year, a certified psychotherapist in um, oh. California, got into a private counseling practice and basically stopped doing research focused on counseling, okay. stepped away. And the early 80s, he – Humphreys and Miller, his, his um, protege, now his partner – co-authored heaps of articles on gay subcultures, looking at victims of homophobic violence, and just mm. trying to yeah, you know, yeah, cool. study, understand, help shit out. By 2004, the book, The Tea Room, had sold nearly more than 300,000 copies. Yeah, cool. So I don't know what the numbers are now. I couldn't find them. 300,005. 301. But apparently, other than textbooks, it's one of the biggest selling books on sociology ever written, wow. written by a sociologist, yeah. which is pretty impressive. And his work has had a long legacy yeah. and continues to. So just a little snippet. So I found a, a New York Times op-ed and it was talking about the case of a senator, a Republican senator from Idaho, Larry Craig. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Larry Craig in 2007 uh-huh. was arrested for lewd conduct in a men's restroom at the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. And it, it was clearly, unambiguously a case of entrapment by a uh, police dude. Oh, okay. And it looked like they, they were – you could argue they were using the tea room book, both of them, as a, as a freaking handbook manual for signals serious? and stuff. Seriously, entrapment. Get fucked. Like, oh, yeah. unambiguously. Like the, the – they yeah, he totally set him up. He used the signals. The guy actually wanted oh, to like, – no, uh, uh, So the senator though, and this, and this is part of this whole story that ran through a lot of um, Humphrey stuff. The senator was a classic upstanding, God-fearing, mm-hmm. married with kids, moral majority, American conservative – Loudly professed Christian values and the goodness of, you know, normalcy. I don't love his hypocrisy. No. But uh, – No, wouldn't have been great. But also, what a shit position to have – Also, don't entrap people. No. Oh, no, that's garbage. Also, don't entrap people for something that isn't criminal. Exactly. Exactly. There, 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 is, there is no – Two dudes say they want to do it, I, they can do it. I, I, will, I, I will accept – Potentially a, a hypocrisy line here. I don't mm. know the rest of his arguments. If mm. he's like running some anti-gay line elsewhere and he's like, I do different things in private, get fucked. But the implication was made. But seriously, if like if this is your if this is your just get fucked. Yeah, seriously. It's outrageous. And when you look at the people like the senator and other men like him, Lord Stuff gets heavily drawn on. So the author of this op ed was saying, look. In cases where men are either arrested if it's illegal or at least publicly shamed if it's not illegal but, you know, frowned upon, most of them were married. Their houses were just a little bit nicer than most. Their yards a little bit better kept. They were well-educated, worked longer what hours. What are we saying here? But she's saying these are the kinds of men that were often getting busted or shamed for it. They tended to be active in church and community, but they were also unusually politically and socially conservative and very vocal about it. Yeah, yeah okay. They had nice families. They had nice families who believed that what their proud their fathers would proudly preach in public about the sanctity of marriage and all that sort of stuff. So it's a very strong public facade of yeah, upstanding family values, all, all that kind of stuff. And this yeah. is what way back the author refers back to Lord's observations, which also applied to his old man, the paradox of the breastplate of righteousness. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because of these men they had they had so much to lose by their secret lives being exposed. They more they would more doggedly and publicly acquire the trappings of respectability. Yes, I hear it. So the armour is particularly shiny quality, you know. It tends to blind the audience to the certain yeah, I am, other aspects I am of his so life. Yeah, I so upstanding yep. and so heterosexual. Exemplar just, oh, of good and righteous behaviour. It's, it's, it's the culture that makes that kind of thing. Oh, yep. man. And this author goes on to note how Humphreys, again, adding to the stories that continue, the secret offender may well believe he's more righteous than the next man, hence his shock outrage and disbelief, his indignation when he is discovered and discredited. His shock. Like what? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and she winds up, public sex is certainly a public nuisance. I, I get what, she, what I think. I'm, charitably, I'll say what she means is no one wants to walk into her, a toilet sh- and see people going for it, whoever they are. Sure, 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 yeah. sure, sure. But she goes but, on to say but, criminalizing but, consensual acts is not helpful. Well, in, indeed, not helpful, but also – also, public nuisance. It's it's that the it's a little bit of a stretch. Like like people do things that are in in a bathroom stall yeah. that are expected in a bathroom stall that no one else needs to see. Like, like we, reading, yes, or other. I don't like people watching me read. No, no, <laughs> it's just weird. <laughs> sure, but you're doing your number twos, and it's like okay, it's a private thing. Yeah. And is it that disturbing no. to do something else? But it's, a- it, it is described as public nuisance because you shouldn't bang where people can find you. 
And yes, the classic. What if a child where walks people, in? Where people can find you? What is the what is the find? So they see two sets of feet. Well, yeah. Assuming. I mean, yeah. if you leave the door open, this, this, that's different. That could be an issue. Yeah. But she says, look, that, like criminalizing consensual acts not helpful. The only harmful effects of these encounters, directly or indirectly, tends to be from the police activity that ensues. Yeah, of course. And she goes on referring to Humphreys again. Again, remember this is describing an op-ed about many men in a, in America in the two thousands who are being busted, arrested, or whatever for being you know, hypocrites, so to speak. Yeah. So she says blackmail, payoffs, the destruction of reputations and families, all result from police intervention in the tea room scene. Yeah, indeed. And she goes on to say, what community can afford to lose good citizens? So like, why are you trashing people for that? Her close is, and for our part. Let's stop being so surprised when we discover that our public figures have their own complex sex lives and start being more suspicious when they self-righteously denounce the sex life of others. Exactly. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Talk about, talk about something else. Like just, just – Get off uh, it. Yeah. Just fuck off. Yep. So, look, it's not always recognised, but the Tea Room books apparently, many agree, spawned what is now many generations of researchers looking at impersonal sex in public settings. Yep. To many degrees, not acknowledged. It has basically been – there's a debt for all the, the work that has come since then on HIV, AIDS, behaviours, se- safe sexual practices between non-traditional types, as it were. Yeah. Arguably goes right back to him, particularly. Not only, but particularly because – I'm sure. Opened you know, the door. Like, yeah. like, like absolutely and said, oh, this is a sociological thing worth looking at. Mm. And so the ethics thing is not that straightforward. So in his final years – so he, Humphrey's – served as a, a consultant to police forces, so he often provided expert testimony for people who got busted for this dumb shit and, uh, and so forth. So he'd often- To police yeah, forces? Yeah, it's a bit confusing. But given they started to back off, hopefully I'm guessing some of what he said was, that, that's not a crime, why worry about it? Yeah. Uh, uh, and these people are upstanding citizens, okay. why All the right. hell would you All get right. onto it? He had his position at Pitzer, one of those fancy colleges, you know, the liberal things, right up to 1986, but apparently- he wasn't that engaged with teaching and there are a bunch of student complaints, but I don't know. Only one source mentioned and fuck knows what about. And finally he died from complications of lung cancer in 1988. Mm. So it's tricky, right? Yeah. Like it's tricky. Because when I first heard this story, it was in passing in an ethics class that someone else was running. Yeah. And they said, you heard about this. And all they did, as you'd expect, was talk about his methods. And of course you go like, dude. Then you go, okay, it was 1970, ethics were different. Oh. But they very rarely then go into possible positive ramifications. Totally et huge. So, yeah. I, I totally huge positive ramifications. Mm. I think. I think the work needed to be done. He could have been more ethical. Could absolutely, done better, yeah. he yep. absolutely could have yep. done better. But he did. He did a lot right, and and there wasn't probably. You know, if, if it's just your supervisory panel and no ethics boards, there's not a lot of community around to say, hey, maybe do this in a better way. Yeah. Uh, don't wear a disguise. Yeah. Standards of the time did differ. Still though. No. Wearing a disguise. It's hilarious. Honestly. God no, damn. I'm not him. God damn. I'm his quite similar looking but unrelated human who never met before. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>